What's the difference between men and women? Well, how do they differ? Well, the first thing we might observe is that if you look at personality differences be, be, between pu prepubescent boys and girls, they're not very large. Boys and girls don't differ in terms of their, their trait neuroticism, for example. What happens is that when puberty kicks in, women's trait neuroticism rises, and it stays higher than men for the rest of their life. And this is why you, you see this reflected in the different kinds of psychopathology that beset the two sexes. So men are overrepresented in alcoholism, drug abuse, antisocial personality, and a, a host of learning disorders as well as attention deficit disorder. And women are overrepresented in depression and anxiety, primarily. That seems to be tightly associated with higher levels of trait neuroticism. Because maybe it's, if you're at the 95th percentile or higher, let's say, in trait neuroticism, there isn't much different than, difference between that and being somewhat prone to depression and anxiety. And because the curves overlap, you know, the, 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 the curves aren't identical, the normal distributions aren't identical for men and women, you tilt the one to the, to the right, to the w women's curve to, to the right towards higher levels of neuroticism, you go out and you look for the person in 20 who has the highest levels of negative emotion. It's much more likely to be female than male. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out why. So, I'm going to tell you some things, basic differences between men and women, and you can tell me what you think about it if you, or if you agree or disagree. Okay, first, size differential emerges between men and women at puberty, right? Because boys and girls are roughly the same size and roughly the same strength, but men get bigger at puberty when the testosterone kicks in, and more importantly, not only do they get taller and heavier, but their upper body strength is much higher. And that's a real issue for, for combat, because human beings punch. There's other animals that do that. Kangaroos do that too, eh? So we're not, the, we're not the only people that punch, but we have clubs on the ends of our arms. And so that's how we defend ourselves. And so if you have a lot of upper body strength, especially across the shoulders, and you're heavier, then you can step into the punch, and it's a lot more devastating. Now, it is the case that if you look at the statistics for Physical altercations in marriage. Women attack their husbands more often than the husbands attack their wives. Well, you think, why is that? Well, let's assume that there isn't any reason other than both people in a relationship can get upset, and the women know that if they hit their husbands, nothing's really going to happen. Right? Because if you're a, rel you know, if you're a woman about that high, and your husband is, say, my height, you're, unless you hit me with an object or something that's sharp, the probability that you're going to do me any serious damage is pretty low. You might hurt me. But if I do the reverse and hit you, and I really hit you, and so the reason, at least one of the reasons why women can be more physically aggressive in minor ways in a relationship is because everyone knows, the wife and the husband equally, that the consequence of the physical aggression is much more limited. So men do more serious damage to women, but women are more aggressive in relationships. So that's interesting. So, okay, so there's a, there's a body size difference that's important, a strength differential that's important. Next thing, I think. So let's assume that the reason that women are higher in sensitivity to negative emotion is because the world is actually more dangerous to women, right? Because that would be the most logical reason why there would be a sex difference in, a sex difference in something like fear or sensitivity to punishment. Well, first, there's the danger of physical altercation. Second, there's the sexual danger. So women become sexually vulnerable at puberty. And why do I say vulnerable? Well, it's straightforward. It's because the cost of sex for women is way higher than it is for men. Or it certainly has been throughout our evolutionary history. Because if a man has an unwanted sexual encounter, well, then he walks away and maybe he's persecuted by the state or prosecuted by the state for it. But if a woman has an unwanted, unwarranted, or incautious sexual encounter, and she ends up pregnant, then, well, in traditional societies, that's you're just done. And even in modern societies that are rich like ours, you're, it's, it's a, I don't have to go into that. It's big trouble. No matter what you do about it, it's big trouble. So being, being more nervous about that makes perfect sense. But then here's the last thing. And I think that women's nervous systems are not adapted to women. I think women's nervous systems are adapted to the mother-infant dyad. Because you are not the same creature when you have an infant. Not at all. You're way more vulnerable. And it's partly because you have to express the vulnerability of the infant, and you also have to care for it. Right? So, you think about an infant, especially under nine months. So, let's say, how are you going to be wired up if you're going to optimally care for an infant under nine months? And I'm saying under nine months because women generally do the bulk of childcare for infants who are under nine months old. 
And part of the reason for that, there's a whole host of reasons, but part of the reasons for that, obviously, is that they breastfeed. But imagine what you need to be wired up biologically in order to care for an infant. First of all, they're very demanding, right? Because they're completely helpless, and they're demanding 24 hours a day. And it's quite, it, it's quite, uh, it's quite a emotional load. And an infant under nine months is never wrong, right? What you do to an infant under nine months is when they're in distress, you always respond. You never tell the infant, get your act together and stop whining, right? Which you can do, say, to, an in, to a child that's 18 months old. You can start having that sort of conversation. But under nine months, it's like, nothing is the infant's fault. It's surrounded in an extraordinarily threatening world. And you have to be responsive to what it needs, regardless of what you want. And you have to be very sensitive to the threats that emerge in the environment. And so I think the price that women pay for that ability to have an intimate relationship with infants in the very earliest stages of development is that their nervous systems are actually wired so that they can perform that role optimally. And the disadvantage to that is that having a temperament like that doesn't work that well when you're dealing with adult men especially when you're dealing with them in a business environment, because it's not the same thing. Not at all. It's a competitive environment. So, okay, so agreeable people are compassionate and polite. What are disagreeable people like? They're tough-minded, they're blunt, they're competitive, and they won't do a damn thing they don't want to do. So it isn't exactly that they're aggressive, although they will push you the hell out of their way if you're in the way. They're not, they're not like volatile like you are if you're high in, in, in neuroticism. It isn't defensive aggression, it's more like predatory aggression. It's dominance behavior. And so for someone who's, high, who's high, highly disagreeable, they look at uh, the world as a place in which they can compete and win. And I'll tell you a story. I have a friend, I gave him my personality test, the big five aspect scale that Colin DeYoung developed huh, in my lab. And uh, I knew he was a disagreeable guy. And, by interacting with him. Um, I mean, he's even rude to people sort of spontaneously on the street. I actually like him quite a bit. He's very, very funny. He's also very conscientious, so you can trust him, but he's disagreeable as hell. And uh, so I gave him this test because I thought it would be funny, and he came out as the most disagreeable person in 10,000. So reasonably, reasonable in, in compassion, about 30th percentile, but like 0 0.001 in politeness, so he's extraordinarily blunt. and He'll just say absolutely anything, no matter how horrible it is. And he was often brought into corporations to sort of clean them up. So if a corporation was tilting and not doing well, they'd bring him in to find out who the useless people were and fire them. And I talked to him about that, because I've had the misopportunity to have to not have graduate students in my lab, for example, that weren't performing well, and I find it very, very difficult to you know, dress someone down and certainly difficult to fire them. I just hate it because I'm actually quite an agreeable person, much to my chagrin.